Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, The Environmental Causes of Schizophrenia, Developmental Hazards, Social Defeat, and Drug Abuse. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or submit your problem to the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Sir Robin Murray. Robin Murray is a professor of psychiatric research at the Institute of Psychiatry and indeed has spent most of his working life there apart from one year in the USA. Fortunately, the latter did not do him too much harm. His particular interest is in understanding the causes of psychosis, and he and his colleagues have contributed to the understanding that environmental factors such as obstetric events, heavy cannabis use, and migration increase the risk of developing schizophrenia-like psychoses. He also sees people with psychosis at the South London and Maudsley NHS Trust, who have been referred from across the UK because they have not responded to treatment locally. He has written numerous articles, not all of them boring, and he is the second most frequently cited psychiatrist outside the USA. He has supervised 52 PhDs, and 35 of his students have become professors. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2010 and received a knighthood in 2011. I will now turn it over to Dr. Murray for his presentation. Thanks very much. So I'm very pleased to talk with you. And I'm going to talk about the environmental causes of schizophrenia. But of course, when we're considering the environmental causes, we have to, of course, realize that genetic factors are important. We've known that for very many years, but since last year, we know some of the specifics. There was a huge study published in Nature of 37,000 cases of schizophrenia and 113,000 uh, healthy controls. And this showed that there were 108 loci significantly associated with schizophrenia. So this was a fantastic a really important uh, finding. I was at the conference where this was uh, announced and the audience stood up and cheered because it's the first big breakthrough in the genetics of schizophrenia. And here you can see my countrymen in Scotland out in the, out in the street uh, shouting, hurrah, hurrah, 108 loci for schizophrenia. So this has been, this is a big deal. And we know that some of the genes implicated include HLA and that maybe the HLA type interacts with infective causes that we've known about in schizophrenia. One of the genes was the DRD2, the dopamine gene, and we know what many of us psychiatrists spend our time by trying to block this receptor with antipsychotics. Some glutamate genes which uh, are involved in the control of dopamine and some neurodevelopmental genes. And we've known for a while that neurodevelopment is important in a schizophrenia. And from the environmental point of view, we can now get a polygenic risk score so that everyone from a patient to you and I can have a polygenic risk score done to assess our li liability to schizophrenia. And of course, we can then see how that interacts with environmental factors. So polygenes are important in schizophrenia. And now that we know that more than 100 genes are involved, this is not compatible with the idea that schizophrenia is a discrete condition. It's more compatible with the idea that there's a continuum of liability to psychosis. So psychosis is a bit like a hypertension. There's a distribution through the population. Most people aren't very, very paranoid or prone to psychotic ideas, but you all know you'll have some friends who are a bit suspicious, a bit paranoid, 
can get the wrong idea. Once this goes past a particular cutoff point, they need to have a, some intervention. We call this clinical psychosis. And schizophrenia, although there's a lot of fuss about the exact definition, it's really just severe psychosis. So you can think it's like the distribution of blood pressure, a particular cutoff for hypertension, and another, and severe hypertension is called malignant hypertension. And schizophrenia is like malignant psychosis. We also know that copy number variants are involved in schizophrenia, where there's a deletion or a duplication. These account for about 10% of cases of autism. They're also found in learning disability and epilepsy. And there's been the question, are they found in schizophrenia? And indeed they are. This is the first study was published in 2008 and there have been many replications. Here's the replication that I was involved in. Large recurrent micro deletions, that's copy number variants associated with schizophrenia. You can see there was a huge number of authors. I actually there was more authors that there were 76 authors. There were only 66 abnormalities in all the patients with schizophrenia. But it got us a paper in Nature. You can see me in the middle in red there. Uh, so it's a great thing to collaborate with a geneticist because you, you take the blood, you, you send it off, and you get, your, you get a paper in Nature. But the importance of the copy number variants in schizophrenia is that it, neuro, it, it reinforces the neurodevelopmental hypothesis. For 30, 25 years, we've thought neurodevelopment was involved in schizophrenia, but now that there are these copy number variants, which where there's a knockout or a, a deletion or a duplication of a neurodevelopmental gene, this confirms that there is a, a continuum of developmental impairment from learning disability to autism to schizophrenia. Though bipolar disorder is not associated with neurodevelopmental uh, abnormalities. So, you can think that one route into schizophrenia is a developmental one. There are some children who show subtle motor cognitive and social deficits compared with their brothers and sisters. They get social anxiety and depression as they go into their teens and begin to develop quasi-psychotic ideas. And CNVs, copy number variants, are one cause of this, that they impair certain neurodevelopmental uh, genes. Also, other little little genes like uh, BDNF or uh, DISC-1 <coughs> or ZNF, they're also involved in neurodevelopment and they, together they may impair uh, neurodevelopment and put people on the, on the cascade towards schizophrenia. This can be compounded by pre- and perinatal events. Uh, we know, for example, that hypoxia, if you have, say, hypoxia at birth, a prolonged labor, if you have, if, uh, if you're born preterm, all these factors increase the risk of psychosis. And there's some, some evidence, not really very hard, that prenatal infection may also increase the risk of schizophrenia. So probably individuals have their genetic susceptibility. Of course, many, many of us had difficult births. But if you have the genetic susceptibility and then hypoxia at birth, the two may interact to push you on this cascade towards schizophrenia. So you end up in your adolescence being a bit odd, having some quasi-psychotic ideas, suspicious of your uh, schoolmates, but you're not psychotic. What is it that converts you into psychosis? Well, we know in psychosis there's dysregulation of the dopamine system that much evidence suggests that the final common pathway to schizophrenia is excessive a dopamine synthesis and release in the striatum. And in this slide, you can see the striatal dopamine neuron producing too much uh, dopamine, and we psychiatrists spend our lives trying to block the blue uh, postsynaptic receptors. Of course, it would be more sensible if we could decrease the release of dopamine, but we can't do that, so we block the receptor. Now, we know that that occurs when people are acutely psychotic, but what about in the prodrome, before people actually develop the full-blown syndrome, when they're just 
wondering whether somebody is speaking about them, wondering if they hear a voice, wondering whether uh, somebody is interfering with their brain. Does, do such individuals also have increased dopamine? And this is a study by Oliver Howes in our department. And this is a PET scan study using fluoradopa to estimate the uptake and synthesis of dopamine. In blue are the controls. In red are frankly psychotic people. And you can see that that's significantly different. In the middle are people in the prodrome with this so-called at-risk mental state, of whom about a quarter will go on to develop psychosis. And you can see that their dopamine levels are midway between the controls and the psychotic people. Here's, here's another way of looking at it. Here are the controls in the beige, uh, yellowy. Here are people who do not, who have uh, the prodrome, have the at-risk mental state, but they do not transit into being frankly psychotic when they're followed up. And in the red are people who at baseline when first seen are in the at-risk mental state but go on to become psychotic. You can see that they already have the increased uh, striatal dopamine. And this next slide shows uh, that as they go towards the frank psychosis, so does their striatal dopamine gradually increase. So it's striatal dopamine that is the crucial factor <coughs> in a changing an individual from a, a, an eccentric, odd adolescent or young adult into a frankly psychotic one. It's the dysregulation of salience caused by the excess uh, dopamine. So that's the developmental route into psychosis, partly genetic, partly environmental. But we know that drug use can also increase the risk of schizophrenia. We've known that for 50 years, uh, 60 years now actually, uh, that uh, Philip Connell wrote a monograph of a series of people who had amphetamine psychosis and they looked exactly like paranoid schizophrenics. And in most cases of amphetamine psychosis, if people stop taking the amphetamine, then after a few weeks or a few months, the psychosis goes away. But in about 10% of cases, it doesn't. The longer you've abused amphetamine, or indeed methamphetamine, because in recent years, methamphetamine has been a much bigger problem than amphetamine. Methamphetamine psychosis spreading from the Far East to Australia, South Africa, California, and then across the States, that it's quite easy to understand why this causes psychosis because amphetamine, methamphetamine increase, uh, effectively increase a synaptic dopamine. And the more synaptic dopamine you have then in, in the striatum, then the more likely you are to be psychotic. But what about cannabis? I, and of course, attitudes to cannabis are changing. Here you can see um, an advert in, I think, Santa Monica Beach, Beach in California. You can, if you've been out in the sun, you've got a sore head or you're feeling a bit miserable, you can go off and see a doctor and get medical marijuana, which will cure all known diseases. Or the doctor will say it will cure it and will charge a, a <coughs> for his prescription. And, of course, uh, some Californian doctors are getting very rich on this. Uh, here is... Uh, uh, Barack Obama, who's struggling to try and, uh, this is of course a spoof uh, uh, picture, but he's str struggling to know whether the, 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 the federal government should change its attitude to marijuana or not. So most people who use marijuana have no problems, just like most people who use alcohol have no problems. And I show a picture of Obama because the last three presidents of the U.S. have all uh, used uh, uh, a, a, a cannabis marijuana. Bill Clinton, your member said he didn't inhale. I, I think uh, uh, George Bush, I think, used uh, <coughs> marijuana, but also uh, some, some other drugs. And Obama, in his youth, used marijuana. They don't. They didn't seem to come to any harm from the from the cannabis. But there are some people who come to harm, just like with alcohol. Most people use it sensibly don't have any problems, 
but a few people use it excessively and develop problems. And with alcohol, it's liver failure and so on. With the cannabis, the big problem seems to be psychosis. And in the left-hand bottom corner, you can see that there have now been nine cohort studies. That's studies of the general population divided up into those who smoke cannabis and those who don't smoke cannabis and then followed up for a period of years. The biggest study is the Swedish study, Swedish Army study, 50,000 men followed up for 25 years. And the ones who smoke cannabis at baseline when they were 18, they were three times more likely to become psychotic. And there's a whole range of studies. You can see right the odds ratio on the right-hand side of the, the cohort studies. Uh, <coughs> you can see that all the odds ratio is, is increased in every case for those who are using cannabis. And that's very unusual in psychiatric epidemiology for all the studies to go in the same way. So people said, well, maybe the people who are using cannabis are using other drugs. So some of these studies have controlled for that, got rid of people who are using amphetamine and so on. Others said, well, maybe they're peculiar people that are using can cannabis. And so in other studies, they excluded anybody who at baseline appeared to be abnormal. Whatever you try, whatever confounders you look at, you can maybe decrease the odds ratio, but you can't get rid of the effect of cannabis. So I think it's generally accepted now that using cannabis has a modest effect in increasing the risk of psychosis. And of course, it depends on how often you take the cannabis and as we'll see the uh, potency of the cannabis. Up on the top right hand corner, you can see our particular study, which was carried out in New Zealand. In the pink, you can see the risk of psychosis by, by 26 years. If you started using cannabis by 18 years, it was one and a half times. So it just increased it a little bit, not significant. But if you started using cannabis by 15, you went four, four and a half times more likely to develop psychosis. And several other studies have also shown this that if you use cannabis when you're 12, 13, 14, then your risk of developing psychosis is considerably greater than if you wait till you're in your 20s or, or, or later. One of the interesting things that has been happening to cannabis is that it's been becoming stronger. So if you think of traditional cannabis from the hippie days in, in the 60s and 70s, the proportion of THC, that's tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient in old-fashioned cannabis, was maybe about 3 or 4%. But it has slowly increased. Uh, not in all forms. This is cannabis resin, which is commonly smoked in Europe, not so much in the States. And uh, it stayed much the same, at least in the UK, around about 5% of uh, THC. This is imported herbal cannabis, maybe called weed or marijuana often, and you can see it's got a bit stronger, up to about 9% THC. But what has happened uh, in Europe and lagging a little bit behind, but also in the States, has been uh, the, the, the engineering, really, uh, or the plant engineering uh, to produce much uh, higher concentration of THC. So now, that you can get a particular form of cannabis called sensamila or often called skunk. And this has a THC content of about 16 to 20%. So that's maybe four times stronger than a traditional old fashioned cannabis. And this is associated with a greater risk of schizophrenia. For example, this is a study that we've done in South London. Actually, Martha de Forti <laughs> was the lead a researcher, and this looked at all the patients who came into our a local hospitals with first episode of psychosis and compared their use of cannabis with that of the local general population. And we could show that 24% of all cases of first episode psychosis in South London were attributable to the use of high potency cannabis. That is to say, if nobody smoked high potency cannabis in South London, there'd be one, near, nearly one quarter fewer cases of psychosis. Now, we live in South London, an area where cannabis consumption is very common. So I'm not saying that everywhere uh, 
a quarter of all cases of psychosis are attributable to the use of high potency uh, cannabis. But the, in, in other countries, people have made estimations of 15% or 12% or so, so on. So anyway, it would be very good if we could persuade people not to smoke the high potency cannabis, even to go back to a traditional lower potency cannabis would be uh, ben ben beneficial. So this is this shows why the, the high potency cannabis is such a, a problem. This is the risk of being a psychotic case in Dr. DeForti's study. Over on the left, you can see people who've never used cannabis, then people who have used hash or resin, and it, it almost looks as if hash or resin is uh, protective, but that's not significant, the, the decrease there. It's when you start using skunk or high potency cannabis, your risk goes up. So if you use it less than once a week, you double your risk. If you use it at weekends, you treble your risk. If you're using it every day, high potency cannabis, uh, one, or two, one or more joints a day, you, your risk goes up five times. It's, it's called skunk in Europe because of the, the, the strong smell of the, uh, of the cannabis. So it, it, that would suggest that if people won't give up cannabis totally, it might be better for them to go back to old-fashioned hash or resin than smoke no cannabis. It is, of course, the case still that only a minority of those adolescents who use high-potency cannabis will develop psychosis, just like only a minority of people who drink alcohol uh, heavily will become dependent and, and develop liver, liver failure. So naturally, we've looked to see whether there's, there's any genetic susceptibility. Is that there's an environmental risk factor that interacts with genes? Well, the environmental risk factor is obviously cannabis. And indeed, there have been three genes that have been associated with increased risk of psychosis if you take cannabis. It was a study of methyltransferase. Absalom Caspi was the first author, suggested uh, that if you had the MET, met a genotype, then your risk was much higher. Now, that has never been properly replicated. But there are two other genes uh, which do increase the risk of psychosis if you take a cannabis. One is the DRD2, the dopamine gene, dopamine receptor gene, and another is AKT1, which is involved in the dopamine signaling after the dopamine receptor. So it seems that these genes are post, post the receptor. So genes are making the receptor uh, <coughs> more sensitive, seem to increase your risk of going psychotic <coughs> with uh, cannabis. So what's the mechanism where, where the cannabis user uh, is converted from a calm uh, person enjoying their joint uh, to being psychotic? Well, some very interesting work by Natalie Genovart in, in Switzerland has shown if you give THC, the active ingredient of cannabis, to rats, interestingly, you don't actually increase the dopamine and the striatum in the long term. You get a, a, a transient increase and then you get a, a decrease in the a dopamine, but you seem to get the post synaptic hypersensitivity. And that's a bit reminiscent of what I just told you about the, the genes. It's the genes uh, postsynaptically that seem to make you more uh, vulnerable. And so what Natalie says is the result of the in interplay of presynaptic hypo hypo function of the dopamine, but postsynaptic hyperfunction means that there's a net facilitation of dopamine activity and it's maybe this which accounts for the psychotic, psychotogenic effects of THC. I've explained this a little more in the next slide. So this is a study showing dopamine synthesis in regular cannabis users versus non-users. In the blue are the controls, in the green are the cannabis users and you can see that they managed to depress their dopamine uh, levels by constant uh, use. Abhi Dargam has shown that even in such people where they have low dopamine, if you give it amphetamine and produce a small increase in the dopamine levels, 
increase that would not have any effect in most of us. This precipitates psychotic symptoms in these cannabis users. And that is, I think, because they have this a super sensitivity. And my colleagues and I have written a paper saying that chronic cannabis use induces low striatal dopamine, as do other dependencies, but also the concurrent development of postsynaptic supersensitivity. So when you take your, once you have the cannabis, once you have the supersensitivity and you're smoking your joint, as well as getting the normal high, you also get the supersensitivity, which gives you, which causes the, the, the psychosis. So, as well, so that we, I showed you the developmental route into psychosis. Here is also the a dopamine dysregulation of salience route. Uh, you, you have the drug abuse coming down here, and some individuals are particularly uh, susceptible. So there are at least two routes into psychosis, the developmental route, where individuals often have problems from very early in life. And then there are the drug abusers. And interestingly, they are often not, well, usually they're not developmentally impaired at all. Rather, they're often uh, very clever, very sociable, and street smart. The sort of boy at 13 or 14 has got lots of friends who knows his way around. He's socially able enough to find a, somebody to give him cannabis and he's clever enough to get money out of his parents, to con money out of his parents to pay for the can cannabis without them finding out. So these are street smart kids who uh, are quite different to the neurodevelopmental, the impaired ch children, but they end up sadly with uh, the same psychotic syndrome. So there's the, the developmental route, there's the, the drug route. What about social factors? Now, for most of my life, we academic psychiatrists tended to discount the effects of social factors. But really, in the last 10 years, we re we've realized that social factors are indeed important. This is an epidemiological study of first episode psychosis in three Eng English cities. All individuals living in three defined areas who presented to psychiatric services with their first psychotic services in psycho excuse me first psychotic episode so we could estimate the incidence of psychosis and indeed of schizophrenia in these three different cities and psychosis and schizophrenia were much commoner in central London twice as high as in Nottingham and in Bristol and actually higher in these cities than in the country there's lots of studies showing that the incidence of schizophrenia is higher in the city. We used to think this was caused by social drift, of people drifting down into the city. It's not. It's mostly caused by uh, inner cities breeding their own people with psychosis. And interestingly, in Europe at least, it's the northern cities. If you look at the cities in Italy and Spain, their rates of psychosis are much lower. Why? Well, uh, drug abuse and of uh, amphetamines and of high potency cannabis is higher in Holland and in Britain than in the Mediterranean countries. But maybe there's also something about the the social experience and the cities. And so we've looked at social factors. And in this study, we showed that the risk of schizophrenia is increased by migration. Lots of studies have shown that migrants are in increased risk of psychosis and of schizophrenia. And it's quite easy to understand this. If you go to a foreign culture, you don't quite understand it. Uh, you're more likely to think people are trying to, uh, to, to uh, uh, be against you or trick you. So, you know, you, you, for any of us who go to a a, a, a fly into a foreign airport, you actually, you get a taxi, how many minutes is it before you begin thinking, is this taxi, does this taxi, taxi driver think I'm a fool? He's going out in the circles in order to charge me too much. We're all more prone to a paranoid thinking in a country where we're not so familiar with the culture. But, but particularly black migrants, so people from Africa, the Caribbean migrating into Europe, have much higher rates 
probably because of the unfamiliarity, but also because of the discrimination. If you're repeatedly discriminated against, you think people are against you, well, maybe eventually you learn that they're against you even when they're not. So you, you can be almost taught a type of paranoia. So migration increases the risk. Childhood adversity, losing your parent, uh, neglect, particularly abuse, physical or sexual abuse, we all now know that this increases the risk of most psychiatric disorders, including psychosis and severe psychosis, schizophrenia. And we also know that acute stress from adverse life events increases the risk. So it's common, for example, that in the six months prior to somebody having their first psychotic episode, their first schizophrenic episode, that they will have had some calamity happening to them. And usually an intrusive event rather than a loss. Depression is associated more with loss, but being beaten up or being burgled or being bullied by having some event which threatens you is more associated with risk of psychosis. But if, as I stated earlier, the final common pathway to psychosis is dopamine dysregulation, then can social factors cause this? It, 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 presumably, we have a, a unitary hypothesis underlying the psychotic symptoms, the salience hypothesis, then if social factors are involved, they must uh, surely uh, be influencing dopamine as well. And in the last few years, we've begun to realize that this is the case. So, for example, a study by Ms. Rahi and her colleagues in uh, Toronto, they took a uh, 12 ultra-high-risk subjects, these people in the prodrome, and 10 drug-naive schizophrenic patients and they stressed them using the Montreal stress test. This is a, a nasty test, actually. You get people to do a series of arithmetic a, a, a tests while in the scanner, and even though they get some of the, 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 the test right, you tell them they got, they got it wrong. And you also tell them you're doing the worst in the group and afterwards we're going to publish the results and you're going to be really at the bottom. So you're letting everybody down and everybody's going to think you've done really, really badly. You can't be very clever. And so you're really stressed by, by uh, being told this and no matter how hard you try, you're still t told that your results are, are wrong. So when you do this, you get dopamine release, but you get more dopamine release by 6.9% in the high-risk prodromal subjects and by 11% in the schizophrenic subjects. Here, here, here you can see this. The controls on the left, the high-risk in the middle. Uh, you can see in the green the slight increase in their do dopamine release and in the schizophrenic people you can see the greater dopamine release. So stress is associated with dopamine release, and it particularly seems to be the case in in those people who are either in the prodrome or actively psychotic. Here is a study my colleague as Egerton has just completed. It's in submission at present. And this was taking adults who were not psychotic, but some of them had had a nasty childhood and some hadn't. So, for example, in the graph on the left, it's uh, divided by those who had either had severe sexual or physical abuse or hadn't. If we just look at the left graph, you can see uh, on the left, those who didn't experience any uh, abuse in childhood and those on the right who did experience the adversity in childhood. And you can see that the dopamine release a follow, follow, following a stress, the same, the same stress test was uh, greater in those who had suffered the abuse. On the right-hand side of the slide, this is those the, the, these healthy adults divided into those who had not had any changes in their family arrangements on the left and on the right, those who had two or more family arrangements. And so, you know, step, uh, several divorces in the, or separations in the family, 
And again, you can see that those who experienced the adversity of more family arrangements, they responded by more dopamine release. So the point I'm trying to make here is that stress causes dopamine release, but particularly in those who have suffered as adversity as a child. So it does seem that social factors like acute stress or childhood stress can indeed release uh, dopamine. And as we discussed earlier, uh, drugs like amphetamine also release dopamine, whereas cannabis has this more complicated uh, effect on the do on the striatal dopamine system. But all of the stress fact, all of excuse me, all of the risk factors for schizophrenia seem to impact on striatal dopamine. So back to my slide that you've seen already, the developmental route into psychosis, the drug abuse route into psychosis, and here the social adversity route into psychosis. This seems to operate uh, via the uh, HPA axis. So you get increased cortisol, you also get increased uh, dopamine. So there are at least three routes, uh, the developmental route, the drug abuse route, and the social adversity route. So you may think, well, this is all very theoretical. Uh, what, what are the implications for clinical psychiatrists like myself? Oliver Howes and I wrote an article in The Lancet day last year really trying to integrate the biology with what we know about social and developmental and cognitive models of schizophrenia. So the model really would be that you have individuals who are, have a biologically sensitized dopamine system. They may have a inherited diff a different variant of the DRD2 or the AKT1 or some other a gene which a makes the dopamine system sensitive, sensitive or they may have had some a <coughs> A, a environmental factor in childhood which has sensitized their dopamine system or they may have been taking drugs which sensitized their dopamine system. Then they have an, an, an acute social stress that uh, <coughs> say, say, they, uh, say that they, 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 they're assaulted or, or some other adversity happens to them. This will result in them producing more dopamine release. We know when that happens you get aberrant processing of stimuli. Dopamine makes you attend to things. All of us, when we attend to things, we release dopamine. But when you're running on too much dopamine, then you begin to think all sorts of insignificant things are significant when they aren't. So you, I'm sure I, those of you who are listening, you have no idea how many red cars you've seen today. But if you are running on too much striatal dopamine, you notice all these red cars. You think, why are all these red cars following me? Red, red means danger. Are they all out? To, are they all collaborating to somehow follow me? Is there a conspiracy going on to somehow harm me? So, you release more dopamine in response to the stress. This causes the aberrant uh, processing of stimuli. And particularly if you have had a bad childhood, that means you're more suspicious of other people you tend to react in a paranoid way, then you're going to be more likely to develop a paranoid interpretation of uh, these uh, <clears throat> these phenomena that you begin to say. You, you, begin, you think you hear a, hear a voice or you uh, things seem very strange all, all, all around you and you wonder whether people are looking at you strangely. You develop a paranoid interpretation, you develop psychosis. Then what happens when you develop psychosis well, by this time, you're sure that other people are out to get you. And, of course, this means that, say, you, you feel much more stressed. You think people are out to, out to get you. Then, of course, you have an argument with your neighbors. They shout at you. Eventually, the police are called. And uh, at least in Britain, what would then happen would be that the police would call a psychiatrist and a social worker. Psychiatrist would come along. By this time, the individual is barricaded in their house. They're saying, "You can't. You're not going to get me. I know you're out to get to get me." The psychiatrist comes along and persuades the, and says to the patient, "Say, well, you uh, you're not well. You have to come into hospital." And you say, "No, no, I'm certainly not coming in. I know that you're in league with uh, my parents, and uh, 
and these <coughs> people down the road who are out to get me. And, of course, you're more stressed, you release more dopamine, you get more paranoid interpretations, you go psychotic. By this time, you're shouting and maybe you're waving a, a, a knife out your door uh, to stop people getting you. The police come and, and overpower you, take to you to hospital uh, where you're injected. Uh, and, of course, by this time, your dopamine release is uh, as high as possible. So, in a sense, you, you get into a circular pattern of ever more increasing stress and ever more increasing dopamine release. Of course, what we do in the clinic is we try and give a dopamine blocker to block the dopamine release, to block the salience and therefore decrease the paranoid interpretation. And then gradually as people recover, we try and remove the factors that were causing the psychosocial stress. We try and get people to talk about the difficulties that they had in their childhood that makes them more inclined to a, a <clears throat> interpret things in a paranoid way. And uh, so we try and break into this aberrant cycle. So with any luck, I think we can do it. And my view is that schizophrenia is not a deteriorating illness and with proper treatment, we should expect the majority of people to improve and some to recover. So I'll just uh, finish at that point and thank you all for listening. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Murray, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question for Dr. Murray is, how to convince someone who is in denial of their illness? And I'm supposed to answer that in 30 seconds. Wow. I, I suppose <laughs> it, 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 it is very difficult. But I think the most important thing is to persuade the patient that you're on their side. I, I recently chaired uh, for two years a schizophrenia commission in the UK. And many people came and said, I hated the psychiatric services. Nobody paid any attention to me. I, I didn't take my medication. I was a terrible mess. And then I met a psychiatrist who seemed to listen to me and understood me and seemed to care about me. And it was that empathy that seemed to make the difference. So my view is the, is the caring and the kindness and the patience that will help to get people to develop some insight. And they won't necessarily develop it immediately. It may take a, a, a number of meetings. But I think one can be the most brilliant psychopharmacologist and manipulate all the various different antipsychotics. It's not as effective as a good, kind psychiatrist patiently talking with the patient. Okay, our next question. Can hypnotherapy be useful for schizophrenia after a person is stabilized after taking psychi psychiatric medicine? If yes, then how to proceed in hypnotherapy? Can age regression be used? I have never met a patient who has benefited, a patient with psychosis who has benefited from, from hypnotherapy. I've met patients with anxiety or depression or uh, other non-psychotic conditions who have benefited from a, a hypnotherapy. But... I haven't met people who've benefited from hypnotherapy. I have met several patients who've got worse with hypnotherapy. I can think of one young student who actually had the onset of her psychosis after she was hypnotized on stage. So I think people with psychosis have very fragile mental states. And to be pushed into a strange, a, 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 a strange consciousness I think can actually be, be detrimental for people with uh, psychosis. So I'm not against psych psychosocial treatments. I think psychosocial treatments are very important, but I don't think hypnotherapy is sensible for people with psychosis. Thank you. Our next question, regarding the stress-induced release of striatal DA, 
wouldn't this normally result in a desensitization? Well, I think we don't know enough about uh, about this, and I think obviously most of us, when we're stressed, we don't go psychotic, and yet we are releasing dopamine in response to the stress. Of course, it depends how much dopamine we're, 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 we're releasing. But I suspect, we don't know this yet, but I suspect that the difference between those of us who get stressed and get depressed or anxious and those of us who get stressed and then go psychotic is that we not only release the dopamine, but we have some uh, vulnerability at the receptor. So I think it will be that it will turn out. We don't. I, I, I hope we shall know this very soon with all the developments in genetics. But I think it will be postsynaptic a vulnerability that makes one individual more likely to, be, to, to develop the, the, the psychosis when the rest of us can cope with the dopamine increased uh, stress or the stress release increasing dopamine. Thank you. Our next question, why do other agents that facilitate mesolimbic dopamine activity, for example, nicotine, cocaine, alcohol, et cetera, not result in psychosis or increased risk for schizophrenia? Well, it's a very interesting question. And I would agree alcohol does not seem to increase the risk of uh, schizophrenia. I, I, you obviously can cause lots of other troubles. I, cocaine, I, I think cocaine use a, does increase a, the, the risk. There's a study from a, a, man, a man called Callahan in California, followed up all the people in the California health system a, who had been to the accident and emergency unit with either methamphetamine use or cocaine use. Over the next 10 years, the methamphetamine users were 10 times more likely to become psychotic. The coke users were, were four times more likely to become psychotic. So I think cocaine uh, is accepted as be, being a cause of uh, psychosis. No, it, I don't think it's in any way as, uh, 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 as adverse and, uh, or risky as, uh, uh, as methamphetamine, perhaps because people don't take it, uh, they, they don't get just so dependent. The question regarding cigarettes, if you had asked me this uh, three or four years ago, I would have said there is no evidence that uh, cigarette smoking and nicotine is associated with increased risk of psychosis. But I don't believe that any longer. Uh, we have just done a meta-analysis of all uh, studies looking at smoking and schizophrenia. Now, it's common knowledge that people with schizophrenia are much more likely to smoke than the rest of the population. And it's always been assumed that this, this is because they have all sorts of problems. They have a miserable life. They hear voices. They think people are against them. Well, psychiatrists and nurses have tended to say, well, poor souls, if one of their few pleasures is cigarette smoking, let them smoke. But we've now been realized that the people who smoke do much worse. People who, if you go to a chronic a unit for chronic people with chronic psychosis, nearly everybody smokes. And a, but it still could be that that could be a consequence of their illness. So we've looked at people with their first episode of psychosis. People with their first episode of psychosis are three times more likely to be smokers than people who a, are not psychotic. So why are they smoking? Because they, they weren't psychotic then. So there is something something that is driving their smoking before, their, before they develop uh, psychosis. And uh, there are now four prospective studies which show that adolescents who smoke cigarettes, smoke, uh, uh, taking nicotine, are more likely to develop uh, psychosis. So I think that uh, cigarette uh, smoking does indeed increase the risk of, uh, of psychosis. Thank you. Our next question, uh, an attendee is wondering if there are treatments specific for psychoses caused by environmental and social factors in young adults. Well, no, but this has not been properly explored. Until now, most therapy has assumed that people with schizophrenia are all the same and get 
a combination of an antipsychotic, a dopamine blocker, and they get cognitive behavior therapy. That would be the standard therapy in in Europe. So you get psychological treatment and you get an antipsychotic. But for the, 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 it is quite right. There's there's somebody who's had child abuse and whose life has been troubled by that since the since their their youth. Then they obviously need a lot more psychological therapy than somebody who uh, developed a psychosis following the abuse of methamphetamine. So I think I, 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 we're just at the beginnings of this, but I think there are some people for whom psychological treatments are going to be much more helpful. And once we are more developed, and I think there will be particular treatments which may be useful for people who've developed their psychosis following the, the abuse of cannabis. For example, one of the other constituents of traditional cannabis is cannabidiol, which uh, diminishes the effect of THC. And there is some evidence that a cannabidiol blocks the effect of THC, and we're experimenting with its use in people with cannabis-related psychosis. So I think in the future there will indeed be specific therapies for different types of people with, with schizophrenia. Thank you. Our next question, does the dopamine blocker cause the patient to get very sleepy or zombie-like? Yes. One of the big problems in treating people with schizophrenia is that if you give a a dopamine blocker, then it not only tends to diminish hallucinations and delusions, but it also blocks the drive. I mean, what, why do we need the dopamine? We need dopamine for motivation and enjoyment. And if you block dopamine too much, then you end up just as you say with somebody who's a bit zombie-like. Now, sometimes psychiatrists mistake that and they think that zombie-like behavior is what they call negative symptoms. And indeed, there are negative symptoms, lack of motivation in people with schizophrenia. But one of the commonest causes of what you're describing is too much antipsychotic. Now, fortunately, we don't give as big doses of antipsychotics as we used to, and also there are now different antipsychotics which have less a, a sedation effect. So something like old-fashioned haloperidol would uh, especially make somebody zombie-like, or some of the, old, the older uh, intramuscular injections would do that. But there are now some antipsychotics which are actually partly activating. So a, a drug like aripiprazole is much less likely to cause this uh, zombie-like effect. Thank you. Our next question, is there a positive correlation between HIV and schizophrenia? No. I mean, HIV, HIV, AIDS, I, there's, there's no relationship between, as, as far as I know, between HIV and, a, and, and, and schizophrenia. The, the, I suppose the only possible well, I, I, I've never seen any evidence for that. The only possible thing you might say is that sometimes people with schizophrenia are treated so badly and neglected so badly that they end up on the streets and they they might do things they wouldn't otherwise do uh, uh, for money and food. So, But uh, in general, there's no association between H- H- HIV and, and, and schizophrenia. Most of the social problems that people with schizophrenia get into are because they're poor, impoverished, and they have to put up with such terrible circumstances. And if you think about it, people with schizophrenia are acutely sensitized, sensitive to the environment. They're much more sensitive than most of us. And yet most of us couldn't cope with the circumstances that many of the people with schizophrenia they have to put up with. In UK, we don't have so many homeless as in, 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 the, street, in the States, fortunately. But our people with schizophrenia, they often go to a hostel where they might share a room uh, with somebody else they, they, who they don't know. They get relatively little money. They have relatively, they're in a bad part of town. They don't get any opportunities for education. They have a social life that the rest of us would find toxic. Uh, 
and of course it's toxic to them as well, and they, and they tend to break down again. In a sensible world, uh, they would have the best uh, of resources and be protected from all these adversities. But that, of course, is not not the way we tend to treat uh, the unfortunate in Western societies. Thank you. Our next question. What is your opinion on potential PMS treatments for schizophrenia? So the, the question was PMS? PMS. Oh, T T T PMS. I, yeah, so transcranial magnetic K stimulation. Well, there yes. are some interesting studies looking at the question of hallucinations. And some have been positive in saying that uh, hallucinations uh, are diminished or, or even or even go away following a certain types of TMS. I think it's early days yet, but I think it's uh, it, it, it it certainly worth it persevering. I think we're at an interesting point where there's not been much advance in drug therapies recently, so. We've been, people are looking at different types of treatment. And I think a cognitive behavior therapy is now established as being a, a useful adjunctive treatment, but there are also other types of a psychological treatment and social treatments which are useful. The, thing, the best thing for people with schizophrenia is to normalize them so that they live in a normal environment. The worst thing is for people to be isolated staring at the wall and hallucinating. The longer that you spend preoccupied with hallucinations and delusions, the more difficult it is to get, to get ready, uh, to, to get rid of them. Uh, and that's understandable. For most of us, our memories are full of uh, our families, our holidays, our work. If you've been hallucinated for the last six months, your memories are full of hallucinations and paranoia. And the longer that goes on, more difficult it is to get rid of that. So even if somebody who's somebody, somebody can stay in the same medication, but if they can go and work in a voluntary shop, they can meet the other people. The best thing for anybody with with uh, schizophrenia is to get a partner and to to begin to to have you know to to have the same kind of life as the rest of the population. This I think is much more beneficial than anything that psychiatrists can do. Thank you. Our next question, why the risk factor with urbanicity? The major factor is supposed to be social stress and not pollution or bad food? Well, people have looked at pollution and they haven't found much. People looked, for example, at lead, at the lead in petrol and lead in the atmosphere and there wasn't they found to be any, any relation. I, the best studies, of course, are from Scandinavia where they can uh, <coughs> really look at the whole population and they can look at risk in different areas. Uh, and generally speaking, they find that the risk is greatest in the areas of most social, uh, social fragmentation. So if you live in a poor area where you don't know your neighbor, and uh, you don't identify with the people around you, you don't have any a proper social relations with them, then this seems to push up, up, up the risk. In my area, in South London, the parts of, parts of South London where there is the highest incidence of schizophrenia are the areas where fewest people vote in a general election. It's not just poverty, it's whether you feel you're part of the community enough to go out and vote in a general election because you think you can change things. It's the areas where nobody thinks they can do anything and they can influence things. When you walk down the street, you don't know any people. It's full of strangers and some of them might uh, rob you or, uh, or assault you. That sort of area that seems to make people more paranoid and more prone to develop uh, schizophrenia. So we don't know. Well, uh, let me give you another example. I said in Britain, and in Europe, people, black people have an increased risk of psychosis. It's not misdiagnosis. We know that this is the symptoms of, psych of schizophrenia. But if you live in an area uh, 
where lots of people of the same ethnicity live. For example, near our hospital, there's an area where people from the Caribbean live. And it's a very lively, interesting area. And you go to the, the markets and full of Caribbean food and reggae. Bob Marley is booming out over the, over the sound systems and so on. People don't have a very high rate of psychosis there. But black people who are living in a predominantly white area where they don't feel they have any social support and they feel that the white population is hostile to them, they have a higher incidence of psychosis there. So it does seem that social support uh, and uh, interactions with others are, are very beneficial. Why, why are most of us not psychotic? Because our social interactions normalize us. You know, if any of, if any of us came into work tomorrow and somebody said, hey, oh, how, what, what happened to you uh, yesterday? You say, oh, well, it was very curious. I was kidnapped by a little green man who took me off to a planet and assaulted me. We would get fed back that that was a mad idea. So we wouldn't repeat it again. And we might actually uh, begin to doubt that it actually happened to us. But if you're socially isolated, you can develop uh, these uh, bizarre and delusional ideas without them being corrected by, the, by normal social interaction. Thank you. We have time for one more question. When seeing one's child experiencing serious acute stress, being bullied, social stress at school, how can we help the child to not feel the stress too much and lower the risk of developing schizophrenia? Well, I wouldn't like to exaggerate and say that, you know, that bullying is, that, you know, it's, it's a very small proportion of children who are bullied who are ever going to develop schizophrenia. I think one probably has to have the vulnerability. Now, bullying is not good, and, and children who are bullied are going to have uh, uh, lots of other problems, but I don't think one should immediately worry about somebody who's bullied developing schizophrenia unless there is a family history of, of the disease. I don't have any a magic a, a form, formula for that. I think one has to increase the self-confidence of, of, of your child. A, <laughs> one has to take it up with the teacher. Uh, one has to try and, and encourage uh, your, your, your child to be able to develop relationships and to become more popular with, with you know, to invite some of the other uh, children in the class, maybe to go out, to go to the movies or go out for the day, try and support them in, develop, in developing friends. But I wouldn't uh, have at the back of one's mind that, say, uh, just because one reacts badly to bullying, uh, this is necessarily going to uh, uh, make one develop uh, schizophrenia. These things like bullying and child abuse, I think uh, most people who are subjected to these recover. It's it's uh, the combination of the of having the, the biological vulnerability and the social adversity. I think that pushes people over the threshold into psychosis and sadly, if you don't respond quickly, into schizophrenia. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time today. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event and our speaker, Sir Robin Murray. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for the next few months. You'll receive an email from LabRoot alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.